Ra, and you are listening to Spirit of the Dawn Podcast 15. Today, we'll be exploring Grow Paradise with raw model and permaculturist Anthony Anderson. Every single day since whence I wake, I feel the same. Somehow I have changed. Could do the people of the street? Yeah, made me feel it. Somehow life is sweeter every day. Somehow life is sweeter every day. Hey, uh, you've gotta find a time to change. Gotta find the time to find this time to embrace the colors, fine lines and shades. It makes this place, it makes this place great. I'll embrace the change. Whoa, 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 I'll embrace the change. Whoa, whoa. From beautiful Ashland, Oregon, I am Pleiadian Emissary of Light, Caroline Ra. Thank you all for joining me today. Welcome to Spirit of the Dawn. There comes a moment on our journeys when we awaken to a higher consciousness, a new way of experiencing ourselves and our world. While my guest today, Anthony Anderson, was busy building a career as a model, he awakened to a healthier way of taking care of himself and discovered raw foods. He became known as Raw Model Anthony Anderson and his health and career took off. Through this, he experienced a deeper connection to the foods he was eating and to the world of plants. Anthony has launched a new career as a permaculturist, helping to educate others and to build food forests around the globe. He has a beautiful website, growparadise.com, and a very fun YouTube channel, Raw Model. I am excited about talking with Anthony about his own personal evolution and that of our planetary home, Plus, we'll be discussing working with the plants and how we can deepen that connection. I am delighted to welcome to Spirit of the Dawn, raw model and permaculturist, Anthony Anderson. Anthony, thank you so much for joining with us today. Thank you, Caroline, so much for having me. It's a real real pleasure. Thank you. You have learned so much about taking care of yourself during your career as a model. Can you share that part of your journey with us? Absolutely. I started modeling when I was about 18 years old, but the awakening didn't happen for me until I was about 21. I was still living in Minnesota. I was just about finishing up with my university degree, and I started at this point, I started to have a desire of learning again because that was squashed out by about age nine. I still did very well at school all the way through high school and middle school, but I didn't have that passion for knowledge until college was finishing. And I started reading environmentalism books and books about uh, just eating better. And it started to click for me. So by the time I started taking my modeling um, full time, I was a vegetarian. And then I started to, um, I started to travel and then I was living in Europe. So being outside of the United States bubble was very um, profound for me. I was 22 years old. I, I saw everything happening like 9-11 had just occurred. This was like 2002, 2003. So all these things were changing in my life and I became, I felt I became activated. I didn't want to be a part of the problem. I started discovering about where my food was coming from and factory farms, and I just didn't want to be a part of that. So I I thought that the best thing would be to be a part of the solution, so to start eating plant-based, start uh, sharing my story with other people, and just start shining the light. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but just shining my own light, finally living my own truth. So uh, after about a year in Europe, I moved to New York City in 2004. And that's when everything really started to skyrocket. I started to work really steadily. I had a billboard in Times Square with Target, and I was booking jobs. I was traveling all over the world, but I was still eating um, extremely clean, and I was actually a dumpster diver. I was a freegan for about four or five years during this period because I, I felt good about like foraging and living off of the land, even if I was like going to a health food store at 11 p.m., you know. And so <laughs> this weird... I was like, I, I, must, I must be the only person with a billboard in Times Square who's actually uh, dumpster diving. You know, like this has got to be <laughs> some weird, uh, just uh, very ironic. So I, um, I felt it. I really felt it. At first, it was, it was a balance of wa- not wanting to be a part of anything negative and then also wanting to eat for beauty. 
Uh, there's a great book that David Wolf writes called Eating for Beauty. And I found that to be very helpful, very strong reading. I, I loved it. And I felt better. I felt cleaner. And then spiritual stuff started opening up. And I felt like it was always there. I was always a sensitive child growing up. But something was blossoming with the clean diet. And I started to come in touch you know, with my, my heart center. And everything was really falling into place. So that, that was it. It really was. It was just uh, loving myself enough to know that I was worth good food and actually having the realization now that the food I was eating wasn't even really food. Like that was almost like uh, animal fodder or something or it wasn't really stuff for us or stuff for angels. It wasn't angelic food. It was more stuff for like the lower realms and and I, I – I didn't even have the cravings anymore. I mean, I went through a period of about two years where I was fighting these deep cravings that were still inside me. But after I broke through, it was like it was it didn't even register on the radar. So it just takes a little bit of a almost like an emotional detox. I'm sure um, other people have discussed this where you're releasing all of the old programs and where it's like you you don't want that, you know, that treat anymore because you know that there's better ones. There's like good healthy raw treats that are using palm sugar and honey instead of corn syrup and and as as big as that is, it's so missed by most of the population. So that was really it. And then once I started working, everything was just I mean, I couldn't say no to it, you know, and I was feeling better. I started the blog in 2007, the Raw Model blog and the YouTube channel. And um, my identity was pretty tied in to, to it at that point. I was eating healthy. I was booking jobs. I was giving talks. And um, eventually I segued into a more inclusive world of permaculture. But um, at first it really was the, the diet that got me on the right path. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned David Wolf. What were some of the other teachers or books that you read that influenced you on your journey? Uh, early on, um, one of the, the books that was Anne, uh, Anne Wigmore, if your listeners are familiar with Anne Wigmore. With, I was getting into wheatgrass. I was growing sprouts and wheatgrass trays on my uh, balcony apartment. I was um, – what else was I reading – Henry David Thoreau uh, wrote a, a very poignant book called Walden. And I read that as soon as I was moving out to France in 2002. And it was all about simplicity and just wanting, looking for the divinity in life by cutting out all the clutter. And so I started reading books like Voluntary Simplicity and Radical Simplicity. And I just, because I was living out of a suitcase in Europe, everything was resonating with me. Like I didn't want to be bogged down with possessions. I, I liked, you know, seeing new cities and traveling through the countryside and trying new foods and, and all, all that stuff was just really ringing true. Um, Tom Hartman, T-H-O-M, Hartman, uh, his book, uh, The Last Days of Ancient Sunlight, was very good. I mean, there's so many. I was reading like a book every two weeks for a little while. Um, Daniel Vitalis came into my life later on by about 2007, 2008. But his work with spring water and rewilding was one of the most uh, deeply profound uh, lessons that I've ever had. I mean, I've been harvesting spring water ever since. And this has been almost 10 years now. And Daniel Vitalis' work is as maybe um, it can be a little bit uh, scary for some people at first because it's definitely all about you know getting out of our domesticated program. But his his work and all of his efforts are are very dear to me. So I really recommend the listeners check out Daniel Vitalis. Neat. Yeah, I've met uh, Daniel. I went to one of his workshops once, which was a lot of fun. Other than the dumpsters in New York, did you forage at all sure. in you know, Central Park? And I did. Did you get into that? I did very much. I went on a on my birthday, which is June 14th, back in maybe 2005, I went on a Central Park wild food walk with the wild man Steve Brill. And it was $15 per person. And he shows you all the spots in Central Park where there were service berries or otherwise known as June berries, mulberries, raspberries, apples, uh, dandelions. So I became a frequent forager of Central Park. And I know a lot of people are scared about maybe the park is spraying stuff. And But I was picking mostly tree fruits 
And once in a while I would pick dandelions, but those dandelions were alive and happy and I didn't think that they were being sprayed with anything. So, and I never, I was never sick from it. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people do it in case maybe something <laughs> happens. But when I did it back in 2000, in the late 2000s, I was always good and I felt so empowered coming home every day, you know, every couple days with like a big bag of berries and greens. And I would come from a casting afterwards and I'd be dressed all nice after a casting and I would just be picking berries in Central Park and people would be like, what is this guy doing? You know, <laughs> like one guy was like, you look like uh, you might have enough money. You should leave the berries for the birds. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm just picking the ones on the bottom. <laughs> you know? He's like, yeah. so it just kind of confuses people. But uh, it's always been this weird, and I am a Gemini, so it's been this kind of weird balance of my green conscious life and then also doing the fashion model world, which I always saw as a means to an end. I, I loved the freedom that it offered me, and I loved the the mental free time that I could get into gardening. I could do whatever I wanted to. It wasn't taking up my mental capacity uh, to complete my job. You know, modeling, you have to be good at networking and you definitely have to know what you're doing, but you have the mental free time to study whatever you feel like. And some people will take advantage of it and some people won't, but it's there for those. And I really did take advantage. I was always reading books on the subway. I was listening to, you know, Spanish audiobooks on, you know, on the, yeah, like as I, as I was going to a casting, I'd be learning Spanish or French or, so there's so much opportunity for that. But it's, uh, it was definitely a, a weird balance, but it worked. And I felt that that balance could bring more people in to the green lifestyle by seeing some of the jobs that I did. And, you know, it, I felt like it could be some sort of catalyst for people that would be, uh, that, that would appeal to. So I just kept making the videos, kept talking about it and people responded very well. So I, I started speaking in public and, and then just, um, it just blossomed from there. Well, I definitely think having a public platform bridges the gap between the information that you want to share and for people to being open to hear it. So yeah. it, it all really worked for you. And it's interesting at a time where a lot of people in their 20s are losing their path and they really are hiding from their true path. You, you discovered yours and you were true to yourself. And that's really a very special story. There was, um, there was a pull inside me and I feel like my childhood never offered, like many of our childhoods, didn't offer a real rite of passage that ancient, ancient cultures um, would have offered the young people, you know, maybe going through puberty or in, in my world, it was just like you kind of go to high school and you go to college and, you know, maybe a rite of passage is graduation or something, but it just felt way too structured for me. So in my early 20s, I felt that I had to put myself out there, like throw myself some curveballs, you know, that's where I think the dumpster diving started. And I was doing urban camping in, in Europe. I was sleeping outside in a tent in the cities, you know, and I was exploring and, and then I ended up discovering plant medicines and the plant medicines for me, I often did them by myself. And when I say plant medicines, I'm referring to maybe, um, psilocybin mushrooms or, um, Mostly that, you know, I had always, I, I'd been smoking cannabis for a little while and I don't hide that too much. I felt like it was very helpful for me and it saw, it helped me see myself in a different light. But um, it was actually the, uh, the magic mushrooms that really brought the deep lessons of the divinity of the planet. I started to feel plant energy. Um, I would, my whole human story would be erased for maybe an hour and I would be sitting out in the forest listening to the insects. And it was like I was washing away my old hard drive. You know, I was rebooting something and I, it was like I was putting myself through these trials. And I usually, like I said, I was usually by myself and I would just feel so connected to the universe. And I would, you know, I would be some people say like, oh, you should always be with another person. But I felt like the deep lessons were when I was alone. And that's when I would think about like how serious the situation is that we need to get active and we need to not only get active, but make it fun so people want to take part. And that's where all of the paradise creation ideas came from. It's like we need to make this better. But we need to make it fun. Start planting more trees. Start, you know, encouraging people to eat locally and uh 
I, I, it's very strange. You know, it was just like, I feel like people in their low twenties, some of them get into a monastic approach and they become very, and I see that with some people, like they become very hardcore with their diets and, and reading and, but our culture doesn't encourage uh, them and myself to get much deeper than that because there's so many things happening and there's so much noise. And if a person can somehow cut out the noise for a little bit without any teachers the, the lessons will start coming from the silence. And so that's what I did. I lived in Europe. I didn't have a television. I didn't have a, I had a small little flip phone. So I didn't have any kind of smartphone. This was 2003, 2002. And so all of a sudden I'm walking through the streets of Paris without, you know, any kind of CD, Walkman, nothing like that. And I just start thinking about the afterlife. And I start thinking about, you know, why do I believe the things that I do? You know, why do I, you know, why do some governments say that their soldiers get to go to heaven and other soldiers don't get to go to heaven. And I just, all the, the silence brought the lessons in. And I think that's the biggest thing I can recommend to someone is just cut out the noise. And there's uh, the retreat called the Vipassana retreat that I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with. That's called Vipassana. And it's t a 10 day silent meditation. And I think there's a lot of answers in there for people. I've yet to do one myself, but in my life, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself gardening and I've had a lot of those moments, but 10 days straight could be very profound for somebody. So to get the noise out, I think that's where the lessons start to come in. And then you couple it with maybe some plant medicines and just lessons from books and podcasts that we've been listening to and everything can start to make sense very quickly. So um, I just realized that my mission, what I need to do is without even worrying about money is just focus on the paradise creation and just get people into planting fruit trees, food forests. That's really where it's at. Like, are we creating paradise or are we not creating paradise? And it sounds a little idealistic or lofty, but whether it's from the inside or manifest, manifested on the outside, it's all about creating paradise and realizing that we are these angelic beings. And we have perhaps been tricked into thinking that we are not to keep our power away. So uh, by embracing that angelic self, we start to embrace our God self and we start to act as that and create paradise on planet Earth. And uh, again, very lofty and idealistic, but there is some real truth to it, I feel. Well, there's tremendous truth to it. It's absolutely beautiful. And, and idealism doesn't mean that something isn't true. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, and I think some of us are idealists. It's how we operate. I know I do. And that's a strength. It really is a strength. And your story is just so beautiful and how you express yourself. I absolutely really love it. And it's very true about unplugging from a certain mind control that permeates our world and everything that we are trained to experience and going inside trusting ourselves and I loved what you said that you loved yourself enough to allow all this to happen yeah that's really beautiful I have to admit that my childhood was not perfect but I didn't have a lot of abuse to overcome I didn't have a lot of healing to do uh, my parents were great you know if anything it was a little mundane you know, uh, <laughs> there wasn't, that's why I feel like I had to throw myself curveballs when I was in my 20s because it was almost a little too easy, you know. So I, I wanted something more challenging. But that being said, I didn't have much healing to go through. So I, I kind of moved on right away to the positive stuff just to get on with it, you know. And, but being compassionate, you have to realize that a lot of people have very damaging childhoods. And that can be a huge handicap. And it might take people many, many decades to get through it and come to the other other side of positive creation. So uh, I was lucky, you know, and I, I, I thank my parents every day, you know, because it's really a, a huge help to get through all that stuff right away. And, um, and then my story reflects that, I think, and I was able to, in my low 20s, get on with it, you know, and, and start processing stuff that, um, that needed to be processed. Yeah. Can you share with us what permaculture is? Permaculture is a, um, it's a conjugation, I believe the term is, for permanent agriculture. Some say permanent culture, but it's really about agriculture. So it's, I like to say if my grandmother asks or someone, I like to say it's edible landscaping. 
where we're planting fruit trees and berry bushes and we're creating a paradise landscape, uh, almost in, in a non-religious way, the Garden of Eden, where all of our needs are met. Uh, we're working with nature to grow our food and to live sustainably. We're not fighting it. So we're working with perennial polycultures. And that means plants that live a long time and there's a lot of biodiversity. And most people that grow um, food in our culture, the ones that are feeding the masses, are working with annual monocultures. So that, re that requires a lot more you know, gas and picking and labor. So permaculture really is an easy way. It's like lazy people gardening where we're planting nut trees, fruit trees. Um, it, it's a space of love. You know, it's, we're creating a, an edible paradise for our loved ones, our friends, uh, strangers that we haven't even met yet. So by establishing those perennials and then uh, embracing green technology like solar panels, wind, um, an intelligent house design, those sorts of things can liberate us. So permaculture really, I feel, is the key to human liberation on this planet. It's, uh, if anything can do it, it's permacu permaculture, and it's decentralized, and it's up to the individual to do it themselves. So it's kind of this weird twist on our planet where the keys to the jail cell are given to us, <laughs> but we have to turn it ourselves, or maybe we have to climb the fence, and it takes a little bit of effort on our part, especially because we're the first wave of the people doing it again. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, our children, grandchildren can relax a little bit more, but for some reason it's come upon our shoulders. So I, I embrace that responsibility and I know it's, it's okay because I'm having a lot of fun doing it and I get to meet so many amazing people that are involved. Like anytime I travel, it's always in the world of permaculture. So I'm always, I get to stay at these beautiful food forests and I get to uh, meet friends that have cool fruit trees and it's really opened up my world a lot. So uh, permaculture is edible landscaping and it's a, it's a way to create paradise on planet earth. That's fun. And you created your first food forest in Minnesota. You bought some land there. Yeah. Is that, yeah I, tell us about that. That was a really interesting thing because I ended up, um, because I was living so frugally in New York City, I was able to save up a lot of money really fast. So I ended up buying a piece of land in Woodstock, New York first, thinking that I was going to commute into the city, into New York, and then have my food forest in Woodstock. And um I realized that, you know, my parents, they're almost 60 years old. Uh, it's t this is like 2007, 2008. Um, I was already peaked out. And then when I say peaked out, I'm talking like peak oil, peak water. I was already really worried about future resources. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got some resources here. I need to help my parents first. Let's get a, let's get a living grocery store set up in, in their yard. And then I'll take care of this Woodstock situation later. So um, they have two acres there wasn't really all that much space there, but my uncle ha had a piece right across the road and he sold it to me for the market value. And then I started that food forest in 2008. So I started planting a lot of uh, apple trees, plum trees, black currants, um, everything that's cold hardy because it's a zone four. Those that are familiar with the zones, it's zone four B. So it gets down to maybe negative 30. Ne thir that's really cold it's, zone four. It's wow. It's really, really cold. You know, so when I see people talking like, oh, it's getting down to negative 10 or negative five today, you know, it's like, oh, it's much colder. So I have to really adjust my approach. So I've grown in I've grown in many different areas now, like the desert, tropics, and super super cold. So it's been a it's been a good learning experience for me. So after about and of course I made a lot of mistakes, you know, early on. Like I know a lot more, and I would do th some things differently now. But I, I had the love, and I had the ambition. So I just started buying trees, planting them, planting them as best as I could. I built the greenhouse. I had the deck built and I just started, I just started doing it, you know, and now it's been over eight years later and, oh, I mean, my niece, my nephew that weren't even born yet, they were born in like, you know, seven years later, 
Uh, they're walking through the food forest now. They're picking raspberries, eating apples with my mom, you know, and, and it's like, wow, this is paradise creation. You know, that's, that's what it's about. So, uh, that garden brings so much love to my heart and I hope to put a tiny house in there pretty soon. And, but otherwise I feel like it's pretty well established. I keep liking, you know, I'll always probably spend maybe $200 a year and buy some more trees, but, um, mostly I'm just mulching, uh, doing my my organic foliar sprays and just loving on the plants more. You know, my currants, they're kind of spreading. So I'll, I'll take little transplants and put them around. And uh, But it's a two-acre food forest. Uh, I had to dig a well. I have a dome greenhouse. Um, I don't do water catchment yet. I would like to, but right now I have the well dr- uh, dug. So I just use that. And then I don't use solar right now because electric was already wired into the, um, into the property. So instead of investing in panels and everything like that, I really only use a water pump. That's the only electricity that I use on that land. So I just pay maybe like $15 a month for my electric bill. And, uh, but one day I will like to put some solar panels up. But it's, uh, it's a little different. It's Minnesota. It's not as sunny. But it's enough to power a water pump. So sooner or later, I'll get that going. But um, a lot of it's just kind of off-grid. You know, it's a lot of trees. I, I made the swales. I did the earthworks. Um, I keep learning about new plants from like Korea and China that are very cold hardy. So I keep adding in new things. But otherwise, it's pretty established. So I like to go back and maybe uh, do some mushroom logs where I inoculate them with oyster mushrooms and uh, I built a rocket stove there a couple years ago. So it's always little things get added in, but it's pretty stable now. So I uh, I hope, um, let's see, it's 2016. I'm sure by 2020, you know, we're going to have like a real full canopy. Already, you know, we get probably 100 pounds of raspberries every year. Wow. 100 pounds. Yeah. I mean, it's just in that, you know, just the raspberries. So I'm picking currants and gooseberries and uh, sea buckthorn, all kinds of different stuff. But uh, it's coming and it's, you know, it's coming quicker and quicker. And I recommend that people, if they can, buy a larger tree because you're going to get your fruit so much faster and your relatives will be more impressed. And, then they'll, <laughs> and they'll be like, oh, I can do this. Like, but if there's like a little tree, even sometimes they say like those little trees will catch up to the bigger trees. I've done both, you know, and it definitely mm-hmm. depends on mulching. And sometimes those little trees, they need a lot more TLC early on. And the bigger ones, they've already established themselves. So it kind of just depends on, on the tree on a case-by-case basis. But I love having that fruit within year two compared to year five. It is so magical having your own food. Um, my partner Jason and I, we have a small urban homestead here with bees and chickens mm-hmm. and fruit trees. And we're living, we're sharing a dream together okay. and it's really fun. What is your advice to people who think they're ready to step deeper into their connection with that dream? Oh, How- great, uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I would say let's just uh, let's assess our resources, see what we can do. You know, let's see if we're if we're open to partnering with other people. I think there's a lot of magic to be found with that, but there's also a lot of human dynamics involved. You know, and I always did my own project on my own, where I was in control of the design. I was, it was my own thing, you know, and as, as much more difficult as it was, you know, doing some stuff, my occasionally like friends or family would help me with something for the, for the day, but day in, day out, it was always on my own. So I, um, I kind of saw it as a solo venture, but that being said, if you can find people that can add to the synergy, um, definitely go with that. Look into going to the farmer's market and speaking with people that are growing the fruits that you like, growing the foods that you like. See what's possible. If you can step into maybe some small container gardening, that's a good way to you know kind of dip your toes in. I was When I lived in Queens in New York City, I was growing on the balcony. I was growing sunflower sprouts and wheatgrass, kale. So um, there's little ways, but I I think, I mean, like I said before, I'm peaked out, you know, like I, I think that we really need to start taking care of ourselves and our loved ones for the future because I'm not so sure that our quote leaders have that in their interest. So it's really up to us. So if we can 
just put whatever we have into this. You know, if we need to get land, if we need to just invest in some fruit trees, if we already have a backyard, um, that's like the first active step that we can take. Um, if we can, I mean, yeah, if we can get land and really go for it, put up panels, build a, a tiny home, then you start to hack away at those chains really quickly. But the, the, if you want to take it a little bit slower, just ease in, you know, and just start growing a couple things, grow stuff that you like to eat. And, uh, that, cause that's a big thing. People will just start growing lettuce and, and maybe they don't like lettuce, you know, or they'll grow some kind of apple and, and just stuff that you really, really like and stuff that you like to prepare. And, and, um, you know, if you want to work with animals, I really recommend chickens. They're probably the easiest, uh, and most enjoyable. Actually ducks are also another favorite. They're maybe a little more quiet. But uh, I love working with chickens and it's just, you get so many outputs and uh, it's just, and especially the emotional. <laughs> and I start looking around, I start looking at cats and dogs and I'm like, what are you guys doing here? You're like not even, oh yeah, a bunch of freeloaders, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the dog protects the chickens from okay. the raccoons. Oh, that's true. That's true. And yeah. the cats eat the, the mice. mice. Yes, that's true. It's all, we have a lot of, I have eight cats. Okay. okay. I have nine chickens, or we have nine chickens, but. Uh, and everybody. Yeah. Belongs. Everyone's has their place. Yes. Everyone has their place. They do. They but do. the chickens are really, I, I do agree with you that, um, you know, Jason brought the chickens to the, uh, to the, to the mix, <laughs> yeah. and I would never kept chickens before, and I'm the day-to-day -day person who has to oh. take care of everyone, and. They can be so cuddly and so sweet. Yes, they really can. They love to be pet. I mean, different breeds. I found that the Arucanas that lay the Easter egg eggs, those like kind of light teal green, they're very friendly. Like they just like to be held and pet. When another one like um, Rhode Island Reds, they are like dinosaurs. Like they not, <laughs> they are so aggressive and so strong and but they don't like to be picked up. And so every bird seems to be a little different, you know, and. Uh, yeah. I've worked with bees, uh, both in Hawaii and Minnesota, uh, much easier in Hawaii. I'll tell you, uh, in Minnesota, whether it was the overwintering or the chemical agriculture in the nearby areas, I've always had a tough time with bees in Minnesota. And, um, in, in, uh, Hawaii, it was just like, all you do is harvest honey. You just keep, you know, harvesting honey, like, and the bees are happy. The bees, it's just, it's really, we forget like how surrounded we are by either good stuff or bad stuff. So, um, it was a good lesson. You know, my dad's actually going to try bees again in Minnesota this summer. So we'll see. Um, he's going to do the typical Langstroth hive, the box hives, but I really want him to get into the top bar because that's what I was doing in Hawaii. And it was just, the bees seemed so much happier. They can build the comb the way they want to. Um, harvesting can be just as easy, if not easier. And um, you can use some of the wax for candles if you'd like. And it was really, it was a big eye opener for me working with the top bar hives. And then now I actually am developing a log hive that I got the idea from Sepp Holzer, who's an Austrian permaculture culturalist. And I, um, I was cutting down some of these poplars to make some sunlight for the hazelnuts down below. And I found this really big hollowed out log. So I cut like a top piece out of it and I put handles on. And I'm going to start experimenting with that and see how the, uh, how the bees react. Maybe not oh. this year, but probably the next year. That must be beautiful. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. yeah. And actually when I cut that tree, it was full of dark compost on the inside. And there was actually, it had been a, um, maybe a chipmunk nest for probably 30 years. And o oh. over the course of th three decades, there was maybe three feet of black compost inside. And then every so often you'd find a little shred of plastic that, that a chimp had collected <laughs> for the nets. So it was just like they just kept going higher and higher and higher over time. An old journal book from Seriously, the Seriously, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, and it just it smelled like there was really no smell, but just so neutral. And, and then I would just sprinkle that around all the fruit trees. And it's, yeah, it's amazing, you know, beautiful. It's like a little Disney movie when you're in your food forest, you know. And I've, I've had moments when it's like July and everything is just alive. The bees are flying everywhere. And you look around and you're like, wow, I created this with nature. And you get chills, you know. It's like, wow, I created all this. And now it's creating itself. It's continuously evolving on its own. But you were the creator. You were the 
the water bearer. You know, you brought it in and it's a very powerful feeling. And I actually cried sometimes thinking about it because it was just like, wow, this is really divine work here. And I, I just implore people, I beg people to take it on themselves. You know, even if you have a small backyard, just start planting those fruit trees. And before you know it, you walk back there, you're like, wow, I did this. And now I get to harvest the fruit with my kids and my friends. And it's a beautiful thing that it has to be earned, you know, but it's something that once you're there, it's, it's priceless. It really is. You have a really active business now with, uh, your website is growparadise.com. We are talking with permaculturist Anthony Anderson, and you're busy in Los Angeles now. Tell us about the work that you're doing. So it's it's been a really interesting journey. When I'm I'm almost 35. When I was 30, I had my Minnesota food forest all set up. I mean, without the the tiny home, but everything was like in the skeleton was in the backbone. And I was thinking, you know what? I'm just gonna. I've been dumpster diving and saving for five or six years. I wanted to just start traveling. So I was, um, I moved to France, I moved back to France. I was doing some permaculture there. And then I moved to Hawaii and I started living on the big island of Hawaii and then coming back to New York, like half and half still modeling, you know, it was this weird balance where I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the green stuff, but I'm still making some money in this model world. And uh, it's like, uh, so I kept being pulled back to New York city, but w- it was cool because I knew a lot of people there and I could reach out and do some fun things. And I was actually doing some permaculture in New York city. I was planting hardy kiwis for this couple on the upper West side and doing some stuff with the wild food walks and but now I've ended up in Los Angeles and uh, for some strange reason, Los Angeles seems to be the perfect balance between New York City and Hawaii because you still have, it's, you know, beautiful weather. You can do permaculture year round, but there is activity here. There's people doing stuff. There's a lot of good networking here. And so I was, um, and also I never had a car in New York City, not, not really. And it's hard to do a permaculture business without um, a vehicle. So when I was in Hawaii, I started offering these permaculture retreats called the Grow Paradise Retreats. And it's basically a one-week immersion into this lifestyle where we as a team, as a ohana, as a family, we go and forage for avocados and coconuts and mangoes. And then we make food together every night. Uh, we, we rent a boat for the day and we go and we do this wild dolphin swim off on the Kona Coast. We explore, you know, volcanoes and lava tubes and we visit organic farms. And I really make it a point for the guests to meet people that are literally growing paradise. So people that have the established permaculture farms, people that are making a business out of it, you know, like uh, like a lovely couple at Mahina Mele Farm, which means full moon uh, down in South Kona. They have a great organic coffee macadamia business, you know, and they've got three kids and they, you know, it's just like so inspiring to see people that are actually doing it. So I see myself as a facilitator to bring this life to the mainstream. And that's what the retreats are all about. So for a while, we were doing it on the east side of the island, which is uh, the Hilo Pahoa side. And then it's a little rainy on that side. So I found it's actually best for people to come and experience life on the Kona side because it's always really nice weather. And because of the Kona coffee growers, you see large mangoes, you see large avocados everywhere. So it's really great for foraging, for the farmer's markets. And then plus you have easy access to wild dolphins and humpback whales. So um, we've been doing this for a couple years now and I absolutely love it. Sometimes I get a little overwhelmed like I, I'm kind of like a dad for the week and I have to, <laughs> like a camp counselor, like get everybody in the van, you know, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I don't want to like, yeah, you know, I just kind of like everybody to flow and sometimes we'll have like maybe – somebody who's a little bit older and used to a little more structure and they're just waiting. They're looking at their clock, waiting for the, the group to line up, you know, and get on the van and, and it's just a little more relaxed than they're used to. So I, it's always, you know, developing these people skills and balancing everybody's desires and needs. And so I like that, but I really, the, the base of grow paradise has always been the edible landscaping. So, and as giving the talks as well. So now that I'm in Los Angeles, I've developed my edible landscaping business 
And I've, I, I kind of just fell into it through the California Rare Fruit Growers and Ken Love. And there's a great movie online called The Fruit Hunters, and you can find it on YouTube. And around the halfway mark, Ken Love and actor Bill Pullman start driving around Big Island. Looking- I was going to mention Bill Pullman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool. I really want to, now that I'm in Los Angeles, I would love to connect with him and see his garden. Uh, I have this idea of, you know, a, a TV show where we're going to these places, you know, or even establishing these places with celebrities. And then the celebrity will help us establish more places. Like, I really like this idea of including them and making it really fun and appealing, you know. So, and I know that they're a great uh, asset for that. So now I've got clients in Los Angeles. If anyone's in Southern California, I do. I do a really special uh, organic foliar spray. I do all organic, uh, you know, fruit tree planting, maintenance, harvesting. Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a lot going on here, but because people are so busy, they can sometimes miss that. But there's so much citrus, there's so much avocados. Uh, there's a lot of people that are into it. So it's just about getting them excited and then helping them through that journey. So uh, that's what I that's what I do. That's what Grow Paradise is. So I've got clients now, and I'd like to maybe do some retreats in Southern California, but very likely we're going to be doing a retreat at the end of August on the Big Island again. And I've been doing it about two every year, maybe three a year. But I, I, like, uh, I like doing it on the Big Island, and I like doing it on the Kona side. So we've got this balance of retreats and the edible landscaping service. And I, I just hope to um, keep that going. And I'm, I'm back here doing castings. Um, I'm actually going to a casting for a shoe company in an hour after this. And it's got this weird Gemini life going, you know. So <laughs> I was going to mention I'm that. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> you know, like driving in Los Angeles. Like, There's two of you. Yeah, there really is. You know, like I had a, I was one of my clients as a daycare center in Culver City, and you know, like I'm all sweaty and I'm planting like veggies, and these kids are watching me. And then I, I told the client, like I have to go wash up because I have a casting for Dell Computers after this. And she's like, what, the, what are you doing? You know, it's so weird. I think that's why they like to have me there because they just think it's such a funny dichotomy, you know. But. Uh, yeah, so Grow Paradise is growing is growing very quickly, and I've got people that are helping me here, and we're gonna we're producing more videos, and I even want to go on the Walk of Fame and just have the Grow Paradise T-shirts, and I've done this actually in Union Square and Times Square, where I just stand there with a sign talking about Grow Paradise or that Paradise creation is possible, you know. And I have my shirt on, and I just see people look at me. And I just feel like I'm giving them this little download, you know, they might not even know exactly what that is, but just that they see grow paradise, like, oh, wow, like I can actually do that because I don't think that concept is ever presented to us. And once it is, though, something blossoms. And so that's what I'm here for. I just want to maybe put some music on, do a little thing on the sidewalk, showing people what's up, and then uh, hand out flyers, hand out business cards, whatever. And just plant that seed figuratively in their mind and, um, and just watch it blossom. So now that I'm here, I'm, I'm back in this. You know, that's the nice thing about Hawaii is that you're in this very peaceful sanctuary. But then sometimes you feel like I need to throw myself back in the matrix a little bit more and help people. You know, and it, it was kind of, I felt like I was maybe hiding away from the world on the big island. And it's, um, it's a beautiful place to live. And I definitely want to move back to Hawaii in a couple of years. But I know that I need to be here now and I need to be active. And it would almost be like I was wasting the potential. So I'm back in Los Angeles for uh, an unforeseen amount of time. And I hope to uh, just really make a big impact here. You know, I want to connect with a lot of permaculture people like Ron Finley, Larry. Santoyo, uh, all the cool, all the cool guys. I mean, really, there's so much happening. So I'm hoping that within the next couple of years, it'll be a total a paradigm shift where every little kid wants fruit trees in their backyard. Like they might want to live in a mansion with a Mercedes in the driveway, whatever, <laughs> but they want a ton of fruit trees in the backyard, you know? So uh, I think it transcends all classes and all races. And it's really that one, it's the most inclusive message I could think of is that we can create paradise and we can plant it in our backyard and we can enjoy it with our loved ones. 
So instead of like, oh, you have to eat this way or you have to eat that way, it's like just eat stuff that you grow or just eat things from, you know, whatever. You know? And, and I'm much more flexible than I was in the past. I'm, I'm not going to say much more, but I try and go by like the 90% rule or the 95% rule where I'm not alienating myself from my families and when I'm going out to meet people, I'm, I'm a little more normal, you know, but I, th- I feel like my health is at an all-time high because I'm active, I'm still eating 95% really, really clean food and I'm juicing, I'm, I'm, I'm outside planting fruit trees all day and I have a really healthy social life and it's like that balance of everything is really good. I don't like the air quality in, in Los Angeles so I have an air filter in the apartment here and um, I do my best to get out of the city when I can, but I know that everything is temporary and that we're actually angelic beings, you know, in this body to get a little crazy out there, but this body is just very temporary. So, you know, five years in Los Angeles is a sliver for me. It's, it's worth it. It's worth it to be here and make an impact. Um, even if my lungs might suffer a little bit from the air quality, I'm going to get out of it sooner or later and I'm going to live in Hawaii or I'm going to live somewhere else. And, and then after I, after this body passes away, there's going to be other stuff after that, I feel. So um, five or whatever amount of years in California with the air quality isn't the worst. And I'm willing to make that sacrifice to um, – hopefully make a big difference, you know, and that's why I've been inspired to make more videos again and just go out there. I'm going to start interviewing other people and I like to do these three, four minute videos. So it's really appealing for everybody and just get that idea out there that humans can create paradise. And I, I don't even have to get that technical with it. Um, it, it, it needs a little more technicality, you know, especially like how to plant a fruit tree well, but if the love is there, that transcends almost everything. I mean, if you know that this tree is sentient and it has feelings, it's alive, you want to love it. You want to take care of it. And then all the gardening books are kind of irrelevant because you want, you want that tree to live as well as the tree. So um, that's what I want to inspire. And I think once that, that's what I'm here for mostly is the inspiration. The info is all out there. And there's a lot of people that have really good in, uh, informational sites that are that might be a little dry, but it's out there and it's for the people. I'm here to inspire and make these little videos, show people what's possible, show that it's fun, and then um, just kind of attach my face to it. I want to be a model for paradise creation, you know, like mm-hmm. promote that. Use my um, food forest in Minnesota and the, the projects in Hawaii and everywhere else as these prototypes, I guess. And um, that's, that's really where it's at. Oh, that's fantastic. We have had an amazing time today talking with permaculturist and raw model Anthony Anderson. I invite everyone to visit Anthony's website, growparadise.com, and to check out his YouTube channel, Raw Model. Anthony, I'm hoping that in addition to all that you've shared, you could share some closing words of wisdom with us. Oh, well, <laughs> let's see. The most important thing is to, um, like I said before, is to tone down the noise in our lives a little bit and to look in the mirror and realize that the divine is inside us just as much as any religious icon that people worship, whether it's the Buddha or Krishna or uh, Jesus. Um, There's many more, Muhammad, of course. But look in the mirror and realize that you are equal, that it's inside you just as much as it's inside of them, and that it's up to you to make a difference. And looking, really just stepping back and just knowing, and I feel like the the program of our culture is to take that divinity away from us and to make us feel like we have to worship other things and whether it's a false idol or not, but to know that you are an angel, literally you're an angel and you don't, you know, you're not flying around all that, but it's inside you and you can create so much good, whether or not you have wings or anything like that, like you have it inside you and you just have to start acting as if, because you already are that. And, um, you know, there's some great books out there. There's great documentaries that can really speed up that process. But just the little realization that it is inside you and that it's in your eyes when you look in the mirror. And just to take that with you every morning and to start acting like that and in your day-to-day interactions with other people and other beings, animals, plants, 
uh, inanimate objects, everything. I mean, just realizing that the divinity is inside yourself. And once you realize that, you can't really hide from it. And you might forget it sometimes and, and act less than, but still, overall, day to day, you are bringing in heaven to the earth. So, um, there's a lot of good stuff out there, of course. Like this podcast is one of them. Just immerse yourselves with positivity and tone down the mainstream TV. Like I don't watch TV, but when I – sometimes I'm waiting at a somewhere and it's on or CNN's on and just the feeling is like, ah, it doesn't feel right, you know. And as long as they keep people watching, whether it's something or something, I don't know. But as long as they have us in our seats watching something, it takes our power away. So I, I really – ask that people, you know, turn that stuff off and just start living a life that's worth watching itself, worth reading about, worth writing about. Um, because it's, you are the star of the show. And uh, we, I mean, I might not even be, I might not even exist. Like whoever's listening to this might, might be the real, the real person that's meant to hear this. And I'm just a signpost and I'm just here to pass along a message that you actually are an angel meant to create paradise on earth. And that's by planting food forests and getting kids into it and, and just spreading that joy. And that's a real long-winded answer, but I, I feel like that's it, to recognize the divinity in ourselves. And then once it's recognized, you, everything just starts to go on autopilot, and we can't really deny it. So it's, uh, it's really about that. It's just seeing, seeing the angelic God self in each other, in ourselves, and to start taking the responsibility for that. Wow. Thank you, Anthony. That was an amazingly beautiful answer. It has been a, quite a joy for me to have you on Spirit of the Dawn today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caroline. My pleasure. Absolutely. Deep gratitude to Brian, Zach, and Synergy for the use of their song, Embrace the Change. I thank all of you for joining with us today and invite you to visit spiritofthedawn.com for more inspirational interviews. Sending love from my home to yours, I am Theadian Emissary of Life, Caroline Roth.